Wizawat is filmed in front of a live studio audience. So I just watched the new trailer for Paper Mario the Origami King, and it's got me thinking a lot about the Paper Mario series. My love for this franchise extends about as far as most fans. I'm absolutely in love with the first two entries, 64 and the Thousand Year Door. And while Super Paper Mario was a big departure from the established formula, it's still a fantastic game worthy of continuing the series' legacy. Then there's Sticker Star. The problem with Sticker Star is not that it's different, it's that Paper Mario Sticker Star pretends to be a classic Paper Mario game with its return to turn-based combat in the Mushroom Kingdom. Instead, it's a mess of incoherent ideas and a hollow husk of what defined Paper Mario. There's a lot to say about Sticker Star's failures that continued on with Color Splash, but I want to instead focus on what I consider a linchpin feature, integral to the success of the franchise. And it's the reason the Origami King actually gives me a bit of hope. There's a lot going on in this trailer, but what caught my eye is this. I think it's about time somebody made the case for Paper Mario's partner characters. It's funny, I actually started replaying the original Paper Mario on the Nintendo 64 and decided I wanted to talk about it before the trailer for Origami King was even released, because revisiting this classic reminded me of what makes the series so special. You've got to start with its accessibility, as it was so integral to hooking Mario fans who didn't have experience playing RPGs at the time, and that is most evident with the battle system. Damage and experience values are low, and there's only three stat totals to think about. At first glance, it might seem like Baby's first RPG, but upon closer examination, there is far more depth there than meets the eye. By letting the player choose between increasing health points, flower points, or badge points on level up, stat builds prove to be quite flexible, allowing the player to tailor their experience with difficulty. New players might choose to maximize their health points, outlasting difficult fights with large health pools and healing items, while more experienced players might favor a wealth of badges to supply them with strong stat bonuses and powerful or situational special attacks to tactfully take down bosses with ease. Equipping and swapping badges for certain situations was such an innovative mechanic, and I can't believe they haven't been featured since the Thousand Year Door. The host of special moves they provide pair so well with the timed command system that was expanded on from Super Mario. Mario RPG to complete a solid battle system for new players and veterans alike that acts as the perfect through line for exploring this rich rendition of the Mushroom Kingdom. Because that's really what draws me back to the Paper Mario series time and time again. It's not to experience the battle mechanics alone, but rather the tight loop between engaging combat, memorable set pieces, and world building. Every chapter is its own self-contained story, contributing to the overarching narrative, complete with interesting locales that feel familiar to Mario players, yet fresh, full of life, and littered with interesting characters and challenges for Mario and all his new friends to overcome. To deviate for a second, I think when you go back and play this game, it becomes clear why the hard lean into the paper references in the recent games falls so flat, and speaks to a wider issue regarding the franchise. While the final build of the original game has some slight nods to the paper aesthetic, the first concept didn't really feature any paper at all. It simply featured 2D sprites exploring 3D environments in an effort to differentiate the RPG series from the mainline Mario titles something that definitely wasn't out of the question for the Nintendo 64. And what a job it does! When I look at the environments in this game, it reminds me of that intro to Super Smash Bros. with all the Nintendo toys coming to life, like peering into a toy box. And every scroll of the screen is a new diorama for these papercraft characters to play in. But instead of constant fourth wall breaks and humor just for the sake of it, there's touching moments and engrossing story developments. This comes in stark contrast with the most recent titles, Sticker Star and Color Splash. The developers quite literally gutted everything the series had going for it. The combat, the original characters, the compelling storylines, even the visuals, while absolutely beautiful in their own right, lacked the sort of feel and charm that began with Paper Mario 64. That, however, is a can of worms that might be best left for another day. What I will say is there's this void in the newer titles that hasn't been filled since the Thousand Year Door, and I think it's a huge contributing factor towards the downfall of the series, the gradual removal of partner characters. You see, it was actually Super Paper Mario that tried to start getting fans adjusted to a Paper Mario without partners. It did this thing where it gave you partners, 
yet gutted their personality and significance to the story. They definitely supplied some funny dialogue during each of their introductions, but for the rest of the game they shut up and all they did was serve their mechanical purpose. This never sat well with me, but at the time I could overlook it because what was lost was picked up by the other supporting characters, and the game as a whole stayed true to what Paper Mario was about. That was when I realized how important partner characters were to the series formula. They enhanced every aspect of the first two titles. And yeah, I do mean every aspect. From the battling, to the story, to the sheer memorability of it all. If you remove partners, you remove the lifeblood of the series, and everything starts to look a lot more shallow. I can't understate how important they are to the battling, adding a layer of variability that rewards the player's knowledge of its systems with a tactical advantage and even just convenience in a lot of cases. During my latest playthrough of Paper Mario 64, I found myself experimenting a lot with badge compositions to min-max Mario's impact on the battle. But what became even more important was understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each partner, especially after I found the quick change badge that allows you to swap in partners and attack during the same turn. Suddenly, I was swapping in characters left and right in order to utilize their defensive utility and figuring out my strongest attacking options. Like how Bo does the most single target damage early on, but struggles against enemies with high defenses. Or how Cooper has great multi-target attacks with some elemental effects thrown in, but can't target flying enemies. Or how Watt has great disabling options and attack buff and ignores enemy defenses when attacking, yeah, Watt is pretty fucking strong. In isolation, I can kind of see why Sticker Star's battling system is the way it is, because without partners, the original formula loses so much strategy. I would not be surprised if the fact that Miyamoto's desire to simplify the game's characters was a factor in the new battle system's design, because the old formula would end up feeling pretty boring under these circumstances. With this in mind, Partner characters act as an intuitive means of widening the scope of what Mario is capable of, in and out of battle. One of the things I hated most about Sticker Star was… things. Their inclusion into the puzzle solving was meant to supplement the lack of obstacles tied to partner specific abilities, but they come off as uninspired and downright cryptic at times, which became the final nail in the coffin for me. They feel out of place, whereas partners function intuitively because they followed the language of the Mario universe that players have been exposed to for years, making puzzle solving and battling accessible to new players. It's simple and straight to the point, but each of their functions are multi-use and the more complex dungeons found later in the game call up partners acquired in previous areas. This all goes double for the story and atmosphere of these games, because they're entirely built around it. With Mario being the blank slate he is, it's essential to have other characters to bounce story and dialogue off of, and the most memorable chapters of the game are just that because of the characters they introduce. Like, let's take a look at chapter 3, easily my favorite chapter from the game. The previous chapters up to this point have been fairly straightforward tasking Mario with rescuing the star spirit from Bowser's minions. However, chapter 3 turns the conventions of the story on its head. After a disorienting trek through the forever forest, Mario stumbles upon a Boo Mansion where he's presented with exactly what he's looking for. But it's not one of Bowser's minions stopping him from rescuing the star spirit. It's Lady Bo herself who's only willing to ransom him off by securing the safety of her fellow Boos in Gusty Gulch and it's here where her unique personality really shines through. The boos of Gusty Gulch idolize her, and while she loves to bask in their attention, you can tell she really cares about her people and will go to any length to protect them from Tubba Blubba. This is really Bo's chapter, because the terms are set by her, and Mario is just kind of a means to an end, but by the end of it, he earns her respect and she decides to accompany him for the rest of his journey. While I don't think the rest of the chapters in 64 are as fleshed out in this way as they could be, they do speak to a wider theme. Mario isn't really the focal point of the story, instead acting as a means of introducing the player to all these little stories. And his desire to save the princess goes hand in hand with wanting to help the next character he comes across. This concept would become heavily refined in The Thousand Year Door, which is why I think it's as revered as it is. Between Koops' story to gain his confidence and avenge his father, Vivian finally abandoning her abusive sisters, and Bobbery overcoming his grief and the loss of his wife while he was out at sea, the characters experience an immense amount of growth and it makes The Thousand Year Door the touching and memorable story that it is. I've gotta be honest, I haven't played Sticker Star since its release, nor have I even touched Color Splash, and I don't intend to ever play it. I've seen enough to know that even if Color Splash is an improvement, 
I'm just not interested after how burned I was by Sticker Star. I wouldn't even question it if you told me that underneath the hate and criticisms, there's actually a pretty decent game there. The problem I have is Nintendo's willful misunderstanding of the core design philosophy that ignited the development of the series. To differentiate the Mario RPG games from the mainline Mario titles. They achieved that by creating an equally accessible and rich RPG experience. A game that plays into the imagination of fans that want to experience what kind of story the Mario universe can tell by fleshing out the Mushroom Kingdom before moving on to other lands with their own stories to tell, by introducing new characters that feel familiar yet fresh and creative. Since then, they've gone backwards by doing the exact opposite of what they set out to do in the first place. The only thing differentiating this new Paper Mario from any other Mario platformer is the paper aesthetic and faulty game design. That being said, I'm actually willing to give Nintendo another chance here, because when I look at what Origami King has to offer, I see interesting areas, I see a brand new villain, I see partner characters. I'm cautiously optimistic for the Origami King because it looks like they're finally listening, and I think this game has the potential to be a solid middle ground between the Paper Mario we want and the Paper Mario Nintendo wants to create. I'm okay with the fact that this game might not be everything I'm looking for, but I just hope that Nintendo takes a step back this time and realizes what made this series one of the most beloved franchises in the history of Nintendo. As far as Origami King goes, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Hey, just want to give a quick thank you for watching my video. If you'd like to see more, consider subscribing to my channel for more Nintendo related content, as well as coverage of other games. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Wizawut, for video updates, among other shit posts. Finally, thanks to my good friend Rasputin for revision help, as well as supplying his beautiful voice. Again, thanks. I'm Wizawut, but you can call me Wiz, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one.